history. But, it's you know, been described as, as an election like no other. Would you would you feel that's the case? Well, I'm afraid so in some respects. I think that some of the level of, uh, of discourse and debate really has been one step up out of the gutter, and that probably uh, reflects on both sides. Although I think it has to be said that some of the remarks that um, the Republican candidate, Donald Trump, have made, has made really are pretty unprecedented. Uh, for example, suggesting that the election may be rigged before the actual uh, 8th of November vote, uh, as well as suggesting that his opponent should be locked up. These are not the kinds of things one might expect from a mature democracy. And, and just, uh, I mean, it has been described as, as uh, you know, the kind of the least hated person will win. Um, do you think that is the case or do you think that perhaps, I mean, there is a level of support on, on, on either side for both parties? I certainly think that the level of support looks like it is going to be more than four out of ten Americans voting both for the Republican candidate and the Democratic candidate. Um, one can draw their own conclusions as to whether that means the most hated candidate will win or uh, the least hated candidate will come second. But I do think that there's, there, there's been a, a political divide between Democrat and Republican that's been visible for a long time in American politics. And it's probably uh, something that's been exacerbated this time through some of this, this really quite troubling rhetoric that we've been seeing, um, I think, in the, in the lead up to the vote. What do you think kind of socially has caused this sort of like kind of, I guess, disillusionment with mainstream politicians in America? Well, again, I think that this um, uh, uh, kind of populist revolt against elites isn't confined to America. And we see it, uh, let's say, in some respects in the Brexit vote. We might even say that we see it as far removed in places like the Philippines. In America, I think that there are a number of very specific drivers. Um, there's a very right-wing press that is absolutely uh, anti-Clinton and has been for a number of years, going on decades, in fact. Um, and I think that we have a pretty unique candidate uh, in Donald Trump, not least because he hasn't run or held elective office in his entire life. And I think if you had asked most Americans a generation ago, would you consider voting for someone who has literally never held elective office, um, I think that they'd find that pretty astonishing. Uh, it's interesting you say. I mean, I know that America does have a, a very sort of a, a, traditionally quite a, a, a kind of a respect for its politicians. Do you, you think that's now kind of changed very much? I think that's been dragged through the mud in a, a pretty astonishing way that we've seen um, really in the run up to uh, the 8th of November from everyone through the FBI, uh, pretty unprecedentedly uh, breaking its kind of unwritten code of neutrality to the kinds of language that Donald Trump has used, not just on his opponents, but people even in his own party who he don't he doesn't feel has has supported him vigorously enough. Um, I think that there's been uh, no small connection between Donald Trump and what's been called the alt right. Um, but also in the way in which that could, and uh, I think any good citizen would have to hope that it doesn't, could lead to some real um, unrest or sporadic violence uh, on or after Election Day. And that to me is, I think, the greatest concern is that mature democracies do cede and hand power over peacefully. Um, and that has been thrown into question in this election, uh, really, and in American politics for the first time in more than a century and a half. That's profoundly troubling. Looking at Hillary Clinton a second, obviously a lot of the headlines do tend to revolve around Donald Trump, but, but looking at Hillary, I mean, she is the first woman candidate to be president of America, um, or certainly mainstream political candidate. Did, I mean, what do you think, uh, I mean, do you think she would have this level of criticism if she was, if she was a man? Do you think she's attracting more, more or less criticism because of her, of her sex? Well, I think that's a great question. And we could have looked back eight years ago to the first African-American president, uh, Barack Obama, and asked many of the same questions. Um, I do think that there's been some, some misogyny that's been directed at Hillary Clinton. I think it's also undeniable that this idea of a Clinton cartel or Clinton machine is something that have to um, uh, go back to the 1990s for and her husband's presidency, Bill Clinton, from 1992 to 2000. So I think it's something that's definitely been rumbling for a long time. And I think there's something in the fact that the first woman president was always going to face a harder ride than, let us say, the second or third. Uh, at the same time, I do think that that's um, something that we have to place in abeyance and say that this is the nominee for one of the two major parties. And in fact, as much as the world doesn't like it, Donald Trump is the nominee for one of the two major parties. And I think that as much as we can get and glean from policy discussions over these next four days, um, the better, because it's been um, uh, pretty personal and pretty barbed in the run up to this election. Either way, it looks like it's going to be a, a pretty close run thing. Uh, whoever gets in, there's look like, you know, kind of wh where do you think America will be 
regard, you know, depending on either Donald Trump or Hillary getting in, where, where do you think that will leave, I guess, the losing party or, the, or those who voted right. for the losing party? Well, one can only speculate. There have been, again, some suggestions that if were Hillary Clinton to win as is projected, but uh, again, we know that those projections are just that and they're not uh, by any means fact. People have to turn out and vote uh, um, and we have to wait for those results. That they, uh, Some Republicans have been talking about impeaching Clinton or putting that on the agenda really from day one. Uh, and that would only cause this uh, divide, this indeed this chasm between Democrat and Republican to widen. Uh, one can only speculate what would happen were Donald Trump to win um, as we've uh, as identified before, he's already talking about locking up his opponent. And in the early days uh, after a, a, a putative Trump presidency, changing things pretty dramatically. So I don't think that anybody can speculate, really. It's such an uncertain time that um, perhaps unlike any election in my lifetime, what happens after the 8th of November really is uh, absolutely uncertain. And as I said, it must be it must be identified as concerning as well um, from a political and cultural uh, uh, perspective, but also for an economic and market perspective. The idea of Donald Trump uh, sort of closing the gap on Hillary Clinton has spooked markets. And I think that uh, those of us who look at the far right have been deeply concerned, unprecedentedly concerned about the way in which some of those um, uh, racist and white supremacist memes have been so-called mainstreamed into the public discourse. And I think with only two deleterious effects. Uh, it's interesting you talk, I mean, I know kind of Donald Trump's kind of, you know, he has been accused of using this sort of dog whistle tactics of, of kind of, you know, mobilizing perhaps people who, who you would never ordinarily dream of a politician to kind of associating themselves with. I mean, do, do you think that is having an effect either for or against his campaign? Again, too early to tell. It looks like the effect it's having is mobilizing a, a, a very angry base. We saw recently that the Ku Klux Klan has supported Donald Trump. Um, really, there's no end of parties on the extreme right from the Ku Klux Klan and the alt-right, so-called, all the way through to the American Nazi Party, pretty much singing with one voice, not just that they support Donald Trump, but that this is the first candidate that they perceive to represent their true uh, ethnic interests, uh, really, since the 1960s. And I think that, again, uh, must be described as alarming. It is largely unprecedented. And the way in which that Donald Trump, I think, as you said, kind of nodded and winked at some of these people, the classic example is the Louisiana politician, David Duke, who was a one-time grand, grand dragon of the Ku Klux Klan. You really had to, um, to drag a disavowal of support from Donald Trump out of, out of him kicking and screaming. So I think that there is a connection. I don't think that that connection is a, a direct one where he's – He's clearly uh, a candidate for the KKK. But uh, uh, those groups on the extreme right of the political spectrum see him as an, a, a pretty unprecedented opportunity. And I think that, um, again, voters should really consider that, that, that the extreme right and the racists are pretty much speaking with one voice. And I would put it this way. By no means is every person who is supporting Donald Trump a racist. But the vast majority of racists in the United States are voting for Donald Trump. And I think that should give uh, citizens of goodwill and voters real pause before Tuesday, the 8th of November.